I've got a problem up here on the board. We've got a function of two variables, f of x, y is x cosine y. We've got a constraint. The constraint is the unit circle. So we're going to restrict the domain of our function to just being points on the unit circle. Notice the unit circle is a level curve for a different function of two variables. If my function g of x, y is x squared plus y squared, then the unit circle is a level curve for that function. So this function has two variables. The constraint function has two variables. So the constraint is going to serve to restrict my domain. So this would not have a max and min if I didn't restrict the domain because I could set y to be something like 0 so that cosine of y was 1 and then let x be as big or as small as I wanted it to be. So there would be no max or min. But when I restrict my domain to points on this level curve, on the constraint curve, I think there will be a max and min. So the first question I ask is, how do I know that there will be a constrained max and min? Well, we've got one theorem that ensures the existence of a max and a min, and that's the extreme value theorem. Okay. So notice the function I'm trying to maximize and minimize is continuous. Okay. So to answer question one, f is continuous. Whoops. That's not question two. Okay. Now the region D that I'm working on is the unit circle. Okay. Now that's sort of a degenerate region in two space because it doesn't have any area to it. So it's a curve. It has zero area, but it still consists of points in two space. So it counts as a region in two space. Is it bounded? Yeah, clearly it doesn't go off to infinity. Is it closed? That's an interesting question. Yes, it is its own boundary. For every point on this unit circle, I can go a little ways away in some directions and stay on the circle. I can go a little ways away in other directions and I leave the circle. That's the definition of being on the boundary. So the circle is its own boundary, but the circle includes itself. Therefore, it includes its boundary. So the unit circle is closed and bounded. So in this particular case, the extreme value theorem ensures that I will have an absolute max and an absolute min of this function on the unit circle. So the constrained max and min will actually be the absolute max and the absolute min on this particular circle. Now, it's not necessarily always going to be the case that our constraint is going to put us into a closed and bounded region. So the extreme value theorem may not always apply, but it does in this case, so I wanted to point that out. Okay. And then we're asked to find the location and the value of the constrained max and min. Well, this section is all about trying to figure out how to use this method called Lagrange multipliers to do just that. I haven't yet taught you how that works. What I'm going to do is use this as a motivating example and just sort of explore See if we can figure something out. That's going to suggest something. And what it's going to suggest is the technique that we will formalize as the technique of Lagrange multipliers. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by drawing a picture of my constraint curve. So that's one level curve for this function g. That's the unit circle. And I'm only concerned with points that are on the unit circle and applying f to that. Okay. What I'm going to do, and it doesn't need to be clear at this point why I'm doing this, but just that I'm doing this, I'm going to start drawing some level curves for f. And of course I'm going to be interested in the level curves for f that actually intersect this circle because that will give me some information about points on the circle. Okay. So let's start out with the level curve f of xy equals 0. So that would mean that x times cosine of y was equal to 0. So either x would be 0 or cosine of y would be 0. And of course, if cosine of y is 0, then y is an odd multiple of pi over 2. So y would be 2n plus 1 times pi over 2, where n is an integer. Okay. Now, if x is 0, that's just the y-axis. Beautiful. That tells me at this point on my constraint curve, 
f is going to be 0. And at this point, on my constraint curve, f is going to be 0. I'm just going to label that this is 0. Okay. These other parts of my level curve for 0, I don't really care about so much. Okay. Because if I'm at an odd multiple of pi over 2, the first positive one I'm going to hit would be at pi over 2. I'm not going to label pi over 2 because I don't want it to look like it's the level curve for pi over 2. That's still the level curve for 0. This is at a height of pi over 2. It does not intersect my constraint curve at all. The next positive one would be up here at 3 pi over 2. Oh my goodness. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> So these level curves aren't going to intersect the unit circle, so they won't give me any information about the constrained function. If n is a negative integer, the lowest one I would have would be at negative pi over 2. That's still part of my level curve for 0. But these are the only places where the level curves for f equaling 0 intersect the unit circle. So these are the only places on the unit circle where my function is going to map to 0. OK, excellent. I'm going to just start drawing in some more level curves for f, hoping to get some more that intersect the circle so that I start to see some information about what's happening on the circle. Okay, so let's look at the level curve for 1. If I look at f of xy equals 1, then x times cosine of y is equal to 1. Okay. Now, because this product is 1, I know that neither one of these factors can possibly equal 0. So it's OK to divide by either one. So I could say x is 1 over cosine y. I know that's legal because that can't be 0 or the product wouldn't be 1. So x would actually just be secant of y. <laughs> now, I can figure out what that looks like because I'm used to thinking in terms of what y equals secant x looks like. Let me just grab that real quick. I would start with a cosine graph. I would have asymptotes at the odd multiples of pi over 2. That sounds vaguely familiar. Okay. Um, and then I would just flip the bumps, like so. OK. Now, we're just switching the roles of x and y. So instead of having vertical asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2, I will have horizontal asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2. So essentially, these level curves for 0 are going to become the asymptotes that I have for my level curve for 1. Okay. Now, of course, if I'm only concerned with what's happening on this unit circle, because that's my constraint curve, I'm not going to care about most of the graph that I get. But I will care about the portion that's in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. When I had y equals secant of x, that looks like this. It's this bump that opens in the positive y direction. So I'm going to have a bump that opens in the positive x direction. I'm going to have a bump opening to the right. Okay, And here, I can see that the lowest point on that is at the point 0, 1. That's going to become the point 1, 0. And I'll basically have something like this, which is part of my level curve. For one. Okay. So it touches my constraint curve. So I now know that at this point, the f value, f of xy, is going to equal 1, because that's where the level curve for f intersects that circle. Okay. Excellent. So that's going to help us out, because the rest of our level curves are going to be fairly similar. Let's say I wanted to switch to looking at the level curve for 2. So then I would have x cosine y equals 2. Again, because their product is 2, neither factor can be 0. So I could say x is 2 over cosine y. That's not 0. So that's 2 secant y. That's going to look very similar to the graph of x equals secant y, except I'm multiplying the x values by 2, which tells me I really don't care about this level curve. Because between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which is the only place I had a chance of intersecting with the circle, I won't. <laughs> because the smallest x value that I get there is 2. Okay. 
So that's not particularly helpful. So I can see any values that are bigger than 1, the level curve isn't going to intersect the circle at all. So let's maybe look at some values that are smaller than 1. Let's look at 1 half. I'm going to stick with positives, but go smaller than 1. We'll do some negative values in a moment. Okay. So if I had x cosine y equals 1 half, well, I'm starting to see the pattern here. x is going to equal 1 half secant of y. Okay. Now, that's useful because now this turning point will be at an x value of 1 half. That's inside of the circle. But that means that as we open up, we're going to touch the circle twice. So at this point, f takes on a value of 1 half. And at this point, f takes on a value of 1 half. So I can start to see what we're going to have. Now, if I were to look at f of xy equals a third, I would get x equals 1 third cosine y. That would intersect the x-axis at a third, so a little further to the left, and open up like so. So there's my level curve for a third third. So at this point and on this point on my constraint curve, f maps to a value of one third. Cool. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of negative values now. Let's try f of xy equals negative one. Well, then x is going to equal negative secant of y. What that's going to do is that's going to take my level curve for 1, which was this one in green here. Maybe I'll actually draw the negative one in green as well. And it's just going to reflect it over the y-axis. So it's going to, again, just touch the curve right there. So this would be my level curve for negative 1. If I were to do negative 1 half, I would get x equals negative 1 half secant y, which would look something like so. <laughs> All right, so I can see that at these two points on my constraint curve, the value of f is negative 1 half. So let's just take a trip around the unit circle. I'm going to start at the top. Here, because we're on the level curve for 0, I know f maps to 0. f maps to a third here and then a half here. So it seems as I'm rotating clockwise around the circle, my value of f is increasing. And I can pretty much confirm that, because if I were to do the level curve for a fourth, that would give me a similar shape, but it's the turning point would be a little further to the left, so I'd have a point for a fourth here. So I can sort of see that pattern. So we increase. We're a third, we're a half, we're one, and then we start decreasing again. Because essentially, points that are to the left of this level curve are going to have z values smaller than 1. Points that are to the right are going to have z values bigger than 1. But as I move down the circle, I don't cross that curve. I stay to the, I touch it, and then I stay on the left side of it. Whereas with the level curve for 1 half, I crossed it. So over here, I was smaller than a half, then I was at a half, then I was bigger than a half. Now I'm at 1, but I'm not going to cross that level curve, so I don't get bigger than 1, so now we start decreasing. And we hit a half, and then a third, and then 0. And now we're at negative a half. And we cross that curve. So we go from bigger than negative a half to negative a half to smaller than negative a half, more negative. To negative 1, we don't cross that level curve. We just touch it. We stay on the right side of that. So we've got to stay with values that are bigger than negative 1. So we hit negative 1, and then we start increasing up to negative a half. Now we're at 0. So based on that analysis, it sure looks like this point right here and this point right here where the level curves for f touch but don't cross my constraint are going to be the location of my max and min. And in fact, that's the case. So the max is 1, 
That was the z value. This was the level curve for a z value of 1. It occurs at 1, 0. The min is, this was our level curve for negative 1. So the min is negative 1. And it occurs at this point here on the unit circle would be at negative 1, 0. Now, as a general rule, I'm not going to expect you to draw contour plots until you happen upon the correct max or min. But what we're going to do is I'm going to keep this up and in the next video we'll talk about how to algebraically talk about the fact that we touched but didn't cross the level curves at our max and our min and that'll help us to develop this technique of Lagrange multiplying.